Welcome to Chef Marketing Academy. This lecture is on six dimensions of globalization. Globalization is nothing new. Thousands of years ago, we had global trade. The most famous, of course, is the Silk Route, where before the Christian era, the Chinese silk goods will travel to Europe, for example. There are, of course, followers of not only trade, but along with trade, culture, civilization, spirituality. And the migration path, everybody knows, uh, was organized about the Himalayas, through the Himalayas, Afghanistan, just goes on. So trade has been the first symbol of globalization, followed by investment or conquest for resources, which is the colonial expansion during 1800s. As you know, in the old days, the two largest economies from a GDP viewpoint were India and China all the way into 1400s. The Chinese dynasty plateaued by becoming insulated worrying about the influence into the Chinese culture about foreign, especially Western ways of thinking. India was colonized essentially. And as you know, the whole industrial revolution, technology evolution that all came in the Western world, although many of the ideas and maybe sometimes the patents and the products were created out of the Eastern culture. The lecture is not on the history. The lecture is what is happening today, why globalization is inevitable, and despite all the protests that we see, the average public not understanding, but reacting negatively because of the consequences that they experience of globalization. The lecture again is not on the political aspects or the social activism aspect of globalization. Uh, the lecture is primarily meant for business students, business managers to say, if we use the word globalization as a buzzword, are there some underlying dimensions? And through my research, as well as consulting experiences, I have divided globalization into six dimensions. If we understand each one of those dimensions, which has its own unique impact as the world globalization, we also know that these dimensions are not, while they are independent, but they are also in fact having interactive effects, which means one dimension in conjunction with another dimension may create an impact that is probably bigger than even what each dimension will do it by itself. So it is important to understand the six dimensions as an ecosystem and a lot of strategic planning by corporations or if we teach a course in international business, we need to understand these six dimensions. So that's the summary of the lecture essentially. So let's move forward. Before I get into the six dimensions, I wanted to talk about fundamental shift as I see it in globalization. The first major shift is that the economic growth and value add is shifting more and more from affluent nations to emerging economies. Emerging economies were always there since the 1400s, as I mentioned, when the power shifted through industrial revolution to Western economies, were always there in terms of raw material exports. In fact, in the colonial expansion, what you saw were colonies extracting raw materials from the agricultural resources, industrial resources, land essentially, and shipping those raw materials out to Western world for value add, especially in uh, England, for example, 
or to some extent some of the continental European uh, uh, colonial powers such as the French or the Dutch or the Germans, the Italians, the Spanish. Today, the shift is that the value add itself is done in emerging economies with or without resources, but my view is that it's usually with resources. We started outsourcing manufacturing after World War II because of shortage of labor and the manufacturing that was outsourced was mostly to ex-colonies primarily for labor value add. They still had a very inexpensive labor which happens now from manufacturing like garments, textiles and those what one calls mundane industries, you know the traditional industries uh, to in fact a little more advanced industries such as manufacturing steel, manufacturing aluminum, uh, basic industrial uh, materials uh, are doing value add to of course now outsourcing of um, uh, human capital areas such as for example uh, IT services or in fact for example R&D work. That is the shift. Second shift is that the markets in those emerging economies used to be very protected partly due to anti-colonial sentiment and after the independence of most of these colonies after World War II, our British biggest way divested most of the colonies and they were followed by the French in a selective way. Uh, to some extent the Dutch did the same thing. All of the colonial powers began to decide to grant independence to ex-colonies. Those were highly protected markets by regulation. Markets were not allowed to be competitive with the fear that the colonial western uh, industrial companies will take over the domestic markets. To encourage domestic companies to come up, all through the 50s till now, 50 years roughly, most of these nations began to create their own native sons as business heads. So in countries like India, for example, you had the rise of Tata Group, the Birla Group and many other industrial houses as is true in Mexico, as is true in Turkey, as it is true in Indonesia and we can just go on and on. And more recently, obviously, with the collapse of communism, this became true of ex-communist countries such as China, Russia and some of the transition Eastern European economies. This two-dimensional shift that I'm showing you, there is one additional wrinkle. Emerging economies are growing not just on exporting value-added products, fully manufactured products such as made in China, everything from soft luggage to shirts to anything you can imagine today in the world, there is nothing we don't see as a label made in China. But it used to be export oriented economy for value add. As the Japanese did surprisingly after World War II, as did the Koreans later on, so now it is really a lot more for domestic consumption. The demand itself is not just in advanced countries but also in domestic economies. That I want to build that pretty much into my presentation. So what are the drivers? And again, as usual in my lectures, I like to simplify and provide some key drivers. There may be more drivers, but these four are very key in my view, why this shift is taking place. First one and obviously the most common one, which I have talked about in my other lectures also, which is so fundamental for us to understand that a repetition is good and that is aging of advanced economies. Second one is rise of the new middle class which is a very brand conscious middle class among emerging economies especially China and India with a very large consumer market. Third, many of the economies which are the ex-colonies or ex-communist nations began to engage in economic reforms 
by throwing away traditional economic policy theories and begin to embrace that the way to create economic growth is primarily to open up markets for competition. And they went through significant economic reforms in the process and those reforms will talk a little more in depth. And the last driver and a very key one is that emerging economies now have access to global resources, the typical four factors of production as we call them, especially access to land resources, uh, which is basically industrial and agricultural and animal-based raw materials, but also access to capital, access to technology, and surprisingly access to human capital. It is not as if emerging economies have the best human capital in everything. There's a large population base, but quite a lot is illiterate, not even in the modern industrial age, they're still in the traditional agriculture-based economy, and there is actually a shortage of capital, skill-based, for example, in many emerging economies, and therefore search for those assets or resources which now they have as equal an access as anybody else. So let's go into some depth of each one of them. Aging of affluent nations, and the best con country to understand this is Japan. Nobody imagined after World War II that Japan will have a declining growth in the population and now absolute decline in the count of the population. Japanese did not encourage immigration. They were a full-fledged economy, growing very fast through primarily export-based economy, doing value-add as well as growing the domestic economy. And Japan today has, therefore, every month fewer people living than last month, especially Japanese men, and there's nothing they can do. So they have to think through very differently how to organize their economy, and the only way they can organize, like all advanced countries, would be to go into emerging markets or align with emerging markets. So what is true of Japan is true of Germany, which is a net zero population growth, as many people dying as are born, and USA, which is a net positive, but not that great. In fact, in my other lectures, I pointed out that the lowest birth rate, which I still am very surprised, is in a country called Spain. 1.2 children per woman, followed by Italy, 1.3, 1.4, which are all below the replacement rate of 2.1. So there is no real domestic market growth except it will be a slow growth and maybe a little more on value add services rather than on products. Rise of the new middle class is the second driver. Very large emerging economies such as Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, Egypt, India, China are the biggest ones. All of a sudden, a population that was for hundreds and thousands of years in the agricultural economy mindset and a culture has shifted their mindset. Partly it's due to the media exposure, partly through opening up of the markets they have experienced world-class brands and the taste is permanent. Biggest outsourcing is at home. Young generation is no longer want to behave in a traditional way where the wife will be a homemaker, husband will be a breadwinner, and therefore she is groomed as a young teenager to learn how to cook, clean, etc. before she gets married. That system is gone completely. It's not even in their mindset anymore. All these young people are now wanting to buy rather than make products and services at home. And that's fueling the huge growth of domestic consumption. And the sizes are mind-boggling, for example. I just learned that China has become or will become within a year or two the largest beer drinking nation in the world, surpassing USA. China is big in everything. Cell phones, beer, eventually red wine or wine in general, doesn't matter. 
India the same way. India is the second largest in most consumer products and it's the same phenomenon and they all want to buy branded commercially available products. So the biggest shift in competition is from make to buy and from unbranded, unorganized vendors who supply to the local, local markets being shifted and organized at a national level and even a global level. The third one is, as I mentioned, is economic reforms. This happened in China, we know, Vietnam, and now we are experiencing Myanmar. By the way, Myanmar is the country where I was born in 1938, became a refugee in 1941 when Japan took over, and I'm still hoping that before my age catches up with me, that I'll be able to visit Myanmar and see my native place even though from an ethnic viewpoint, I'm of Indian origin, but my parents settled there, which is interesting. And by the way, same economic reforms out of necessity happen in India and Brazil. Global access to resources. China is everywhere, not in terms of making products and selling like made in China, but more Chinese engaged into securing resources for their future. They are in Africa, they are in Asia, they are in Latin America, and this is a very key one. So access to resources for Chinese enterprises and economy is pretty much assured in the future. And of course, the most critical resource for industrialization is the energy or the oil, or energy in general, I would say. India is similarly using its diaspora and its geopolitical alignment to be in Africa in a significant way because that is the largest continent with more resources than the rest of the world put together forever, my view. And Africa also is becoming a market. So if you are there, you can also serve the market. You make the products there because resources are there and actually export into China or export into India, which is a very different paradigm. We want to think through that paradigm from a business perspective. Of course, we have also seen that Canada and Australia are great resource-rich nations. And again, you have seen significant Chinese involvement and influence in the Canadian markets as well as into the Australian markets, especially resource markets by and large. What's the message? The message here is that the best capitalists of today are surprisingly all ex-communist or ex-socialist nations. And especially those nations where they did not change the party, but change the party's manifesto, the mission, the vision. From communism as the ideology to capitalism as an ideology have done very well in terms of a smooth transition. Especially, this is true of China, and of course, India as a socialist country has been able to make a transition to a lot more, let's say, uh, capitalistic economy by opening up to private industries, private sectors, including foreign direct investment. But this is true through turbulence in Vietnam. Myanmar is trying to make a transition similar to the Chinese. Russia went through a revolution almost, where the party changed, not just the manifesto, and therefore you have political turbulence. Eastern European countries, such as Poland, which is a large economy, but smoother transitions is the one that I find have happened, where party has remained in power, but party has changed its own manifesto by and large. So what are the six dimensions of globalization? I'm sure there are more, uh, it's possible. These are definitely mutually exclusive, but I don't think they're exhaustive list per se, but I think the six will summarize most of the discussions on globalization. Uh, the first one is geopolitical realignment. I think in the business schools, we do not teach enough about the impact of the geopolitical aspects, geoeconomic aspects, as they teach regularly in political science or in the schools of law. I think in uh, 
our discipline in business, this is a very important aspect to understand. And as I have done a lot of work in industries and for governments, I find this as a knowledge that I'm learning myself quite a lot. Second one is globalization of competition, which we all know, but I will provide a framework that is unique and different. Regulation reforms, again, we do not study enough in the business schools or in corporate training programs about the impact of regulation change on an industry. We all know it's happening, such as the healthcare regulation in America right now. We know it is happening from product safety laws changes. Uh, we know it is happening, in fact, from uh, environmental protection agency, uh, sustainability aspects. A lot of regulation is coming in and they are changing at the same time, but we do not understand its implication and impact on the business uh, world. Capital markets, another one that usually we don't link it very well in terms of globalization of capital markets. Technology advances. This is probably well researched, but we have not again understood the globalization of the technology from a business perspective. And the last one and probably the most critical one, the most foundational one is changes in the consumption values or the culture of a given country or culture of the world by and large. So let's go through this journey. Next slide shows you the picture of a book called Chindia Rising. I wrote this book as a sequel to Tectonic Shift, which was the first one I really began to understand the geopolitical aspects. I did a lot of advising to the governments. A great colleague of mine, Raj Sisodia, we wrote this book together with a, a what we call a ghost writer essentially. Then I followed up with a special focus on the impact of rise of China and India on the world economy and especially the geopolitical dimension. So let's just go through that a little more. If you take the long term view, where has the economic growth come from? Uh, the growth engines in the 1800s were the European century as we call it, but more the British century, which became the largest power founded on economic principles followed by the military. It was followed by the American century, 1900s was all about America. It rose as a great nation and provided global growth. Now it is the Asian century. Asian century, however, my view is it will be only half the century, primarily because I see the rise of Africa coming sooner than most people will anticipate. And the rise of the Middle East also surprisingly will come sooner than most of us anticipate. So the Asian century means an economic integration of Japan, South Korea, which are two advanced economies with a very high per capita income uh, or per capita GDP even. Then you have China, you have India and you have the ASEAN bloc. I don't think a full-blown economic integration like European Union will ever happen. And there is no need for that. In Asia, pragmatism prevails. Only religion that matters really is money. There is no some such thing as a strong religious-based economy, let's say in India or in China or in most of the ASEAN countries, including Malaysia, surprisingly, and to some extent, Indonesia. So religious-based economies, as it is prevalent in the Middle East, is just not there. And therefore, it is much easier to engage each other nation through what I would consider to be the economic integration without formal uh, boundary removing would be the bilateral trade. So you create a free trade agreement as it has happened with China, the ASEAN bloc, or India, the ASEAN bloc, for example, or India with Thailand, India with whatever countries are. And it's a matter of time before uh, India will have an economic free trade agreement uh, with, let's say, Japan and South Korea. This creates a lot more mo mobility of products, mobility of capital, etc., through trade and investment. And that's what I think so. I think it's inevitable. And in the process, Asia will become 
the largest economic bloc, the trade which is highest in European Union will now become more and more within Asia trade rising faster and faster in the process and therefore participation by Western economies, continental Europeans, the British and the Americans would be secondary. In fact, my forecast is that all of the Western economies will scramble very hard to see how we can participate in this kind of a large trading bloc where they may or may not even want the Western economies. It's that radical a thought that's emerging. As I visit in Asia, the message is that why do we need Western economies? We Asians can do our own things because Japan and South Korea can provide enormous technology if you need it, for example. The only reason you need Western economies, and especially the United States, may be for military uh, security aspects more than anything else. The old triad power used to be US, Canada, North America, the 12 common market countries, which is now foundational core of European Union, and Japan. 45% of the world trade was concentrated among these nations as of 1987. 70% of the world GDP also was only among these nations. And by the way, trade was not more because they still depended on uh, colonial ex-colonies actually to provide raw materials such as cotton, iron, coal, etc. to do value add. This is shifting. And this triad power is desperate for growth and they cannot get the growth by trading among themselves, investing among themselves. So you see the rise of a new triad power which is called United States, a very dominant economy, but India and China. Unfortunately, unlike the previous triad power which really emerged after World War II, the defeat of Japan and Germany provided US and allies to provide a common understanding about markets, economic policies, social policies, political agenda, military agenda. Today that is not the case. And I don't see this journey as harmonious as we experienced second half of last century. For example, US and China relationship are becoming more acrimonious rather than harmonious. On the other hand, India and US are having much more harmonious relationship, especially after signing a strategic alignment or treaty, which basically says that uh, US will be actually a military partner with India, which is unthinkable, let's say only 10 years ago, when the Pakistan was the anchor for the US military presence in Asia. And you see the new angle that's coming in, which is called Chindia, hence I wrote the book, that China and India, rather than rivaling in the world as the world would like them to be, are going to learn how to partner with each other. And the partnership arises by more tourists coming to each other place, more diplomatic relationships, more trade delegations, more chambers of commerce hosting each other, followed by trade and investment. And if you track the data, everything is moving in that direction. So India is in this very strategic position of having a military alignment with the Americans, but having its economic interest and maybe even political interest more aligned with the Chinese. And how do you manage this triangle is a very tricky, very complex thing, and this will have an impact on business relationships. So next page talks about China's growing global influence. China now has the largest currency reserve probably in the world. Chinese are the net creditors or we borrow from them in the United States. The treasury bonds are now held by Chinese, Japanese, South Koreans. Think about that, its implications. They will call the shots on the American monetary policy and the fiscal policy, whether we like it or not, as we did it on the world economies, like the Germans we dictated after the defeat, or the Japanese, for example. China Investment Corporation is not a small enterprise. 
similar to government investment corporation out of Singapore, which is a small relative one in size, but very important. You see that thing. And also we see the rise of uh, Chinese multinationals now, not just unbranded Chinese products or products branded by Western brands essentially, such as a Samsonite luggage on the one hand or even Chanel perfume on the other hand or whatever it is, all made in China but branded which are the Western brands. Today Chinese are now aspiring to say our brands will travel all over the world with quality and reputation similar to what the Japanese did it what the Koreans are doing it right now, such as a Samsung and Hyundai in automobile uh, and other Korean companies, uh, Chinese can do the same thing. Second major dimension of this geoeconomic realignment is what I call South to South trade and investment. Many of the companies from India and China rather than compete in the beginning with the Western economies where there may be more intense competition and the incumbency advantage and the new entrant disadvantage have decided to bypass that for a while. So you have Asian companies in Latin America, you have Chindia companies in Africa, Russia's regional influence enormously, especially in the energy sector. And I have been absolutely fascinated to watch how much Brazil has become the magnet for most Latin America, similar to US being the magnet for most of North America essentially, rather than having this one North-South America integration, which used to be called FTAA from NAFTA, NAFTA. President Reagan had the vision that if we can integrate 20, 34 economies of North and South America, we can create an economic uh, miracle or a growth and it almost got done, but unfortunately the politics changed in Latin America, Central America and the rest is history essentially. Geoeconomic alignment also implies we need to understand rise of Africa. I think this is not as well understood. There are a couple of books that are written now, but I don't think it is more than just writing about Africa as a great market of 900 to 1, 900 million to 1 billion people, I think it's a much more strategic continent out of nowhere. Continental Europe, is it likely to distance from America? Is it a friend or a foe? Uh, my memory is that more than a decade ago at university I gave a major speech about how continental Europe just does not relate anymore to America, which is basically the Nazi movement, for example, World War II phenomenon, the young people today, after 60, 70 years, do not even know the history very well. And they are therefore very new breed of thinkers altogether and they think totally differently. G8, which was the forum created out of sheer economic crisis and necessity of the late 70s and early 80s, already has become G20. So the new geopolitical realignment is unprecedented, is my view. I have not seen anything like it except maybe the colonial expansion as a major historical perspective. Navigating through this new geopolitical alignment will be very important for success of a business. How do you manage this transition toward a new triad power is very important. Do you divest from the old triad power and invest in the new ones? Do you keep both places? How do you bring talent to bear on the Asian uh, markets such as India and China are all the new issues that we are struggling. The second major dimension is globalization of competition. Again, I will provide my views that may be either compatible or in agreement with others or slightly different. The first major point is that the key battlegrounds for global competition will be the emerging markets. In other words, all advanced countries, while protecting the domestic market shares, will make sure that they fight against each other in emerging markets, especially in China, especially in India, 
especially in Vietnam, especially in Mexico, especially in Brazil, and hopefully in Russia. Competition between two consumer packaged goods companies will not be any other place except in emerging markets. And that includes Africa, as I've been mentioning. Same thing is true for Japanese corporations. The automobile manufacturers of Japan, while they will protect their domestic markets and advanced country markets, will actually invest capacity and compete in emerging economies. And this includes Toyota versus Nissan versus Honda. You know, at one time, the competition used to be the advanced countries against emerging economy countries. Today, it will be advanced countries, companies competing against each other in emerging economies. Second, the rise of new global competitors is also equally likely to happen, and especially from China. I think we are underestimating the size and the scale of Chinese corporations based strictly on the domestic evolution which now they can go global in a significant way. So take China Mobile, which is the largest cellular telephone operator company, wireless operator. While Vodafone is number one in revenues, in number of subscribers is China Mobile, but it is all domestic so far and is just expanding into the Asian theater. Or you take Airtel, an Indian company, which already has expanded after 200 million subscribers in India alone by buying out a company in Central Africa, Zain Communications, and today you see Vodafone and AirTouch competing globally. This will be true in uh, Aluminum, where an Indian company called Hindalco, owned by a large business group, Aditya Birla Group, competes head-on with Alcoa in all over the world markets. Huawei Technologies, which we have hear more and more about in uh, telecom infrastructure, IT infrastructure competes head-on with uh, IBMs of the world, the Cisco systems of the world, and maybe even eventually the cellular telephone companies. So as domestic markets are allowed to be competitive in emerging economies, competition in emerging markets will be both global and local at the same time. So how do you compete two fronts? Do you position against one or the other? I think we haven't thought through all of the implications about this type of competition, uh, which is a new dimension in globalization. The most forecast that I can make is like the decade of the 80s, we will see the decade of the 2011, for example, as a big, big industry consolidation on a global basis. In the 80s, we saw a massive consolidation among the European Union companies to prepare themselves for what was known as EC92 or the European Union by 2000 to protect themselves against the Americans and the Japanese, etc. And under Reagan administration, we liberalized everything. We ignored antitrust and allowed major peer-to-peer -peer companies to merge. I think the same cycle will happen again in a very big way. The 2012 elections in the US, people will wait and watch no matter what the outcome is. You have these trillions of dollars of reserves in corporations fundamentally also backed up by a large amount of hedge funds and private equity capital, as well as sovereign capital, which I will talk about a little later on. All of this clearly indicates to me that the next phase in globalization of competition will be consolidation. In pharma industry, I see that thing. Beer industry, we have almost seen that thing with uh, SAB, South African Brewing, buying out Miller, also, the Brazilian company InBev, based in Belgium, buying out Anheuser Bush, and this is inevitable on a global basis. And alcohol beverages have been already consolidating. These are just tips of the iceberg. 
is going to happen in carbon black, very industrial raw material. It's going to happen in steel. It's going to happen in aluminum. It's going to happen in agriculture. It's going to happen everywhere. Second one is emergence of non-traditional competitors. I think while competition will focus upon their immediate competitors, I call this comparative myopia rather than marketing myopia. That means that I have narrowed down my definition of competition into what I know competitors such as uh, Coca-Cola thinking of Pepsi primarily or General Motors thinking of Ford primarily or Toyota thinking of Nissan, etc., etc. We can go on giving all the examples. But in packaged goods industries, I see rise of people who were not even in the packaged goods industry. Retailing, I see the same thing where people who were never in the retailing business suddenly for diversification went or have gone into retailing as it is true in India. We also see enormous growth of nutraceuticals against pharmaceuticals and against uh, any, uh, I would say, non-nutritional foods and beverages. That's all going to be very different competition and surprisingly, as resources become more scarce, as the consumer markets grow for branded products, we will see more and more supplier cooperatives competing in the market. In other words, the supplier becomes a competitor rather than strictly a supplier and a supplier-customer relationship. The main framework I wanted to bring in around here is a framework that my colleague and I created in the, I started working on it in the 80s, I remember. We finally wrote the book around 2003 or 4, which is called The Rule of Three. And I think this is going to happen on a global basis, hence I wanted to take some time to set this framework up for a few minutes and then get into the globalization of the rule of three. All industries we have analyzed, about 150 product industries, you see the same pattern of competitive behavior. On the right side of this chart, which is market share against financial performance, you see a slightly rising sloping curve with a market share of 40%, 20%, 10%. These are the big companies who are full line generalist. On the left side, you see a chart which is a sharply sloping one. They're all niche companies or specialist companies. Surprisingly, Highest financial performance is with super niche companies which have a very tiny fraction market share. And in fact, in my other lectures I have pointed out, as the super niche company begins to grow, actually it collapses and goes in the ditch. Two companies go in the ditch and the rule of competitive ditch is just like a physical ditch. Namely, whoever is closer to the ditch is very likely to go in the ditch. And therefore, number three company, which is just around 10, 11%, when there is a pressure in terms of number one and number two competing, number three becomes the casualty. GM Ford, when they competed in the 80s for market share for large cars, Chrysler became the casualty. When Coca-Cola and Pepsi fought for what we call the soda wars, in fact, uh, number three company, RC Cola, also collapsed. In the beer wars, the same thing, Anheuser, Bush, and Miller, we got slits, paps, all collapsed. And at the same time, you see microbreweries growing or the niche companies growing, which is absolutely unthinkable concept in uh, competition that we have heard. While the big boys consolidate and try to get economies of scale by having more and more common resources or common procurement, wherever you get your economies of scale, while the industry is struggling, actually niche companies grow, which is very different concept. So this concept ultimately is a reflection of what I call the shopping mall analog. Just like in a shopping mall you see anchor stores which are full line generalist and there are only three that usually make money, not four, not two, not five, it's three is optimal and there's a lot of scientific research published in academic journals to prove this point or to validate the theory. 
they are primarily scale oriented full line but you see at the same time specialty stores within the same shopping mall such as for example you have a product specialty like a foot locker they only sell one type of shoes or a market specialty like the Benetton, the Limited, any lifestyle stores. Interestingly, the three major companies that comp compete is pretty much an oligopolistic structure. The little niche guys who coexist are all what in economic, economics we call it monopolistic competition, which means you earn more than average returns or rent as they call it, despite a small market share which is contrary to the original theory that Adam Smith advocated. In other words, it is contrary to the theory of oligopoly, it's called monopolistic competition. And what I find fascinating is that in economics, nobody has talked about how every industry is part oligopoly and part monopolistic competition. In this rule of three through shakeout and mergers, you see the rise of three players domestically quite often, growing to regional level like in Europe from Germany to Europe, for example, France to Europe, Italy to Europe, etc. Same thing in Asia, but eventually it gets into globalization of competition and the rule of three prevails. No matter how big the market size, how big the size of the company makes no difference whatsoever that ultimately you see consolidation and of course the scale is much greater in terms of consolidation of revenues, consolidation of operations, consolidation of market cap, whatever it is. So that's the pattern I want to talk here as opposed to the rule of three theory per se, which is in some other lecture. So you have three US players, you have three or four European players, such as the British, uh, the German, the French, the Italian, etc., whatever it is. And you might have three Asian players or Japanese players primarily at that time. This is all true till the 80s and the 90s for your information. Now you see an industry consolidation on a global basis and therefore actually you see only three global players, not nine, which is the untraditional or un- uh, anticipated or, uh, you know, somewhat of a uh, non-intuitive uh, finding. And it's like a clockwork, by the way. I've seen that thing. And it doesn't matter which product industry you are in. We have to analyze this not as much by a name of a company because in a conglomerate situation, a large business company may compete with different competitors in one product line and Another product line, they will have different competitors. So for example, General Electric will compete in infrastructure with one set of companies, but in energy, somebody else. So in uh, aircraft engines, they will compete with uh, Pratt & Whitney, and they will compete with Rolls-Royce, for example, as a rule of three. Uh, but in the traditional energy business, they will compete with Siemens and ABB. Very different architecture. So this is the same way. So this analysis has to be not at a company level, but product line. And usually this creates more confusion in the package goods companies because most package goods companies are more diversified than I have ever thought possible. Not a diversification from a definition of the stock market analyst because they all think that the company is in the same business and this fools them. So you take a group like Nestle Group or Unilever Group or Procter & Gamble Group and let's say P&G. P&G will compete with one set of competitors in the coffee market which is very different than another set of competitors in the detergent market which will be very different than a third set of competitors for example in uh, cosmetics and personal care and of course Gillette which is their acquisition will be competing totally differently Unfortunately for Procter & Gamble, no competition whatsoever anywhere. But it's a matter of time before number two player in blades will come and a number three player in blades will come. It's a matter of time. It may not be the American corporation, but would be some emerging market enterprise that will jump into the business. So I've seen this rationalization in the 80s, which is a great data point to understand what is going to happen in this decade. We had the three great tire companies, Goodyear, Firestone, Goodrich. 
Japanese had only one Bridgestone at that time. I have added Toyo and Yokohama, which are becoming global players. Europeans had four companies, Michelin, Pirelli, Dunlop, and of course Continental, which was a German company, but was more a specialty for luxury car makers such as BMW and uh, Mercedes-Benz, but it's becoming mainstream now. Globalization took place, radials became the common standard, and now you see complete rationalization where survivors are Michelin, which bought out uh, BF Goodrich, which sold to Uni Royal, combined together, so Michelin owns three brand names. Firestone did the cost cutting, couldn't survive, ultimately ended up selling to Bridgestone, which is a Japanese company. And the lonely survivor from America is Goodyear, and people are not so optimistic that it may survive in the future or may become just a niche player someplace. So you see the rule of three on a global basis. Automobile is a live example going through right now. About 10 years ago when I began to forecast that Toyota, almost around 2001-2, that Toyota will become number one car maker, there was a complete skepticism in Detroit because they thought nobody can compete with GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Like the tire industry, and I've done the similar one for appliances industry, so I was looking at the industry parallels and suggesting that we have to think about Toyota as a number one car maker in the world, which did happen. Toyota is secure in its position. Number two, Ford may or may not be secure. I have not put a question mark, but I should. So we had the traditional players, Japan had a rationalization to rule of three. Americans had a rationalization, but Europeans actually did not have a rationalization or consolidation. And therefore, massive impact in globalization of competition in the automobile industry will be on the European manufacturers. And I'm not even including the rising uh, uh, car makers out of, uh, let's say, China and to some extent India. They will rise. It's a matter of time as to how they do it through acquisition or organic growth. So I, you see a question mark for Renault, which has a great alignment with Nissan. And is it enough? You have to be present in all three markets. So unless you make a major play in America, which they can't, the only play is probably General Motors, which we don't know how it can work out. Fiat again, while it owns Chrysler here, but Fiat is not present in Japan. It is true in emerging markets historically, but its presence in general just is not strong enough to survive unless it makes a mega merger with somebody. Volkswagen is my own personal bet. I think Volkswagen in globalization of competition has evolved in the right way. So if I had to make a forecast, Toyota will be number one, Volkswagen number two, Ford number three would be my thinking. Why Volkswagen? Because Volkswagen has done a great job in China, which is the largest market, is entering successfully in India through a company they own, Skoda, have done a good job of turning around in the US market and putting more capacity. Volkswagen also has luxury brand names. They own Audi, for example, and they own super luxury performance automobiles. So they're truly full line if you look at the, each of the models and the makes that they make. And they have the cash wherewithal to actually grow organically, but they can also make an acquisition at the same time, especially in emerging economies. So to me, this is a good example. The third area, which is very important to analyze, I've deliberately chosen these examples to make a different point. In the, in the case of tires, one large incumbent from each of the three mature economy geographies became the survivor. In the second one, it is really not that architecture as much, although it may look like that, but I see the rise of Chinese car makers changing the paradigm in about a couple of decades. But more importantly is the complete vacuum in the aircraft manufacturing. We used to have three manufacturers, Boeing, uh, McDonnell Douglas, and um, Lockheed. Again, consolidation took place. They're all gone. 
Boeing is the survivor, Airbus is the other survivor, but there is always a need for a third major player, not niche companies who make some fighter military plane or a regional jet, for example, such as the Brazilians or the Canadians, for example, but we are talking about a full service aircraft manufacturing for passenger airlines. I think it's a matter of time and my forecast, of course, is that the third major aerospace company will happen more likely from China. Russians have the possibility, but I'm not so sure that they will invest to make it a possibility. And of course, at one time, Germans were thinking of creating a third aerospace company based in Germany, but I think that is only gone as, as a dream or as, as a vision for the nation. In airlines, which are still semi-government owned enterprises, regulated in terms of pricing and the routes and all the stuff, you see what they have done is very smart to create strategic alliances. Lots of airlines have collapsed, especially in Europe. As we had lots of airlines collapsed when we had the big bang deregulation under President uh, Carter, I think, in the late 70s, for example, and we saw the rationalization to three big airlines, I think what they are doing is very smartly to create strategic alliances. So you have the Star Alliance, which is the largest, anchored to Lufthansa, United Airlines, and in the Asian side, probably Singapore Airlines. You have One World, which is a American Airlines, Qantas, and British Airways, and Sky Team, which is Delta, Air France, and Korean Airlines, for example. So they have to be present everywhere, and you can see you can have an alliance structure. Why the global rule of three may not happen as a globalization of competition takes place. And I find four areas where this may still be a lot more regional uh, rule of three or a local rule of three, and that's because markets are not allowed to be competitive. Uh, the first one is when markets are protected by certain rights or certification or ownership mechanism. In other words, they don't get the full force of a uh, uh, stock market. First one is patent-based industry, which is pharmaceuticals. While I am forecasting more and more consolidation of pharmaceuticals on a global basis, journey is still so long. The largest consolidation we saw in the 80s was GlaxoSmithKline on the one hand and obviously Pfizer on the other hand. But if you look at their market share, none of them really exceeds more than 10, 15% of the total market. It's just too specialized by therapeutic classes, by patent rights. And as patent rights get off, which is the decade happening now, you will see a lot more consolidation. Owner-managed businesses generally don't tend to consolidate. Industries based around partnerships, like consulting companies, accounting firms, where it just is not likely to happen. Again, they would have alliances like airlines or affiliations. Regulated monopolies, utilities are still heavily regulated worldwide. And it might happen as a deregulation, privatization comes, as it happened with the telephone companies in the 80s and the 90s. I think utilities will be in the next decade of the 20s, probably you will see that happen. And if the markets themselves are protected uh, because of the ex-colonial uh, rule and whatever the reasons are, as they liberalize, uh, like Myanmar as an example, Vietnam as an example, as we talked about, India for that matter, a lot of now, right now, pressure, public opinion, especially press opinion on India to say, move fast and open up your market faster. But it's still very protected market, especially for foreign direct investment, etc. So because of that, you will not, may not see the rule of three as soon in those industries.